Vanessa is chair of our internal resident wellness committee, made up of four residents, planning retreats and other wellness activities. She's doing a study on burnout on our resident cohort. That thing is going to be presented here today, I think. Yeah. Uh, Ellen is on the UW GME wide wellness committee working on institutional changes to improve resident wellness and this, there's a study going on there now. Finally CKS which I like it's kind of like RBG I like that. <laughs> Ross <laughs> and Janessa are also in the institution wide committee and the survey is going on right now with 600 house staff to solicit in my younger day, I would have thought that talking about wellness was a sign of weakness, and I don't believe that anymore. So, Janessa, come up. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Rice. <laughs> All right, so today I am going to be talking about OBGYN resident wellness and resiliency, and I'll be focusing on one of the things that really threatens our wellness the most, which is physician burnout and occupational burnout. So my goals for this talk are to increase awareness of the signs and symptoms of occupational burnout, recognize the impact that burnout has on providers and patients, learn for some protective mechanisms for improving resiliency, considering some institutional changes that can improve resident wellness, and share with you some resources that we have available to us at the University of Wisconsin. I have no disclosures for this talk. So first I'd like to um, just acknowledge that wellness really is a bigger constellation of of more issues that extends far beyond this talk. So it's really a compilation of spiritual health, emotional health, social health, as well as your physical health. Um, but what I'm gonna be really focusing on is the area of occupational wellness and occupational health in this talk. I hope it, it, my talk today inspires you to become more self-aware of your own wellness, as well as the wellness of those around you. So I'm just gonna start off with this statement because I feel like this is a common theme that comes back over and over again when researching physician burnout and physician wellness, only healthy physicians can provide optimal care to our patients. Um, if we're not taking good care of ourselves, we really can't be expected to perform at the emotional, the psychological level that our patients deserve, and certainly not at a sustainable fashion. So residency is stressful, there is no denying that. Uh, with our chronic sleep deprivation, um, the countless hours we spend on epic documenting things, the pager that just keeps going. <laughs> Perfectly timed, thank you for my plant. Um, so we all end up looking like this every once in a while. But what I want to differentiate between, is it my pager? Oh, okay. <laughs> what I want to differentiate between is normal versus pathologic stress. So work-related stress is normal. There is some amount of stress um, that comes with work and that can be expected. Um, as we grow and progress through residency, our ability to cope with stress should also be growing and improving as well. But burnout is really a different subject. Burnout is a syndrome that's characterized by three key characteristics. Emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a feeling of reduced accomplishment. And this was first described in 1974 by a psychologist called, um, named Herbert Frondenberger, and he wrote an article called Staff Burnout, where he discussed um, job dissatisfaction precipitated by work-related stress. So a key aspect of burnout is emotional exhaustion. Um, it can come with symptoms of irritability, less patience with your coworkers or patients, um, sometimes feeling helpless, trapped, or defeated. Um, and as one's emotional resources are depleted, um, providers really start to feel that they're no longer able to care for their patients at the psychological level that they normally would when they're feeling emotionally healthy. The second aspect of burnout is the development of depersonalization. So this is the removal of human characteristics from our patients and um, developing increasingly cynical or negative outlook about the future, about patients, about work. Um, some patients or some providers have actually reported that with these dehumanizing thoughts, they can have thoughts of blaming their patients for their diagnoses or, or their troubles. And this was actually really well documented in the 1970s. Oftentimes, depersonalization and emotional exhaustion come together, and so you'll see that um, they're often correlated. High levels of emotional exhaustion come with high levels of depersonalization. So the third aspect of burnout is the reduced sense of personal accomplishment, which can lead to someone thinking more negatively about themselves, um, low self-esteem, loss of motivation, uh, loss of control or skill or mastery of their field. 
And um, physicians who start to feel more unhappy about themselves um, tend to be more dissatisfied with their accomplishments at work. The risk factors for burnout can be divided into two separate categories, um, some personal characteristics of the individual and then also some organizational risk factors. So personal characteristics include um, a type A personality or need for perfectionism, but everybody in this room has some amount of type A personality is why we um, when it's medicine probably. Um, but other risk factors include lack of flexibility, a personal history of a substance abuse or mood disorders. A recent family stress has been found to pot potentially precipitate a burnout. Um, and then there's some more controversial risk factors including PGY year, um, which some studies suggest that maybe it's the interns who would be more susceptible to burnout because of the dramatic change going from medical student to a provider, whereas other studies suggest that it's actually the senior residents who are more at risk for burnout because they're taking on more responsibility, and that responsibility can be more stressful and leading to burnout. Um, there's a possible gender effect. Um, there are a number of studies suggesting that females are more at risk than their uh, male counterparts for burnout, and then there are other studies who, uh, that have found no difference. And then potentially marital status. Um, some studies have suggested, suggested that having, um, being married or having, um, feeling like they're not, feeling like you're not putting enough time into your home life can be a risk factor, whereas other studies have found that having a supportive spouse, a home life is actually protective. And actually parenting was found to be protective because it prevents you from having the dehumanizing thoughts and um, results in less detachment and depersonalization when you have kids. Some of the organizational risk factors include isolation, and that could either be geographical isolation of the resident in a certain area, or feeling isolated within your department or um, division. Uh, increased demand or excessive workload, so the amount that you're having to do every single day can put you at risk for burnout. And then um, dissatisfaction with your peers or faculty and not getting along with coworkers has also been shown to be a significant risk factor. Signs and symptoms of burnout, um, you'll notice that a lot of these correlate and overlap with depression. But just to be clear, burnout can precipitate a depression, but they are two different things, and burnout is not the same as a major depressive episode. So some signs and symptoms include insomnia, sleep problems, including nightmares, appetite changes either up or down, um, frequent illnesses like chronic fatigue, colds or flus, headaches or frequent GI disturbances has been really well documented in the literature, um, irritability, low morale, feelings of cynicism or detachment from work, and then increasingly num increasing number of interpersonal conflicts either at home or with family. So who else gets burned out? It's not just physicians. It's anybody who really works really closely with other people. So teachers, social workers, mental health care providers, and criminal justice have all described these symptoms of burnout. How do we gauge burnout? Um, in 1980, Christina Maslach, who's a social psychologist at Berkeley, she developed this clinical tool, which is a survey that asks about the three characteristic areas of burnout, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and personal accomplishment. And respondents rate their frequency to the various statements on a seven-point Likert scale. When does burnout begin? So I probably um, was of the thought that burnout probably began in intern year when you're making that dramatic change from going from a learner to really taking on that provider role. But what actually um, more data is showing is that burnout starts in medical school. In one recent literature review, burnout rates in medical students range from 28 to 45 percent. And the symptoms can accumulate over time, and if they're not treated and managed at, in medical school, you're more likely to continue to be burned out in residency, which I think makes sense. Um, this was an article from two days ago, JAMA, Prevalence of Depression, Depressive Symptoms, and Suicidal Ideation Among Medical Students. And what they found was that depressive symptoms in medical students was 27.2% in their review, and the overall prevalence of suicidal ideation was 11%. Um, among medical students who had screened positive for depression, only 15% had sought out um, psychiatric treatment. So there are many, many studies that have described burnout in residency in all fields across the country. Um, I chose this particular study to present because it's OBGYN specific data and fairly recently from 2012. 
This was an anonymous survey that was sent out to residents in the Hartford, Connecticut area. And the survey not only included the Maslach burnout inventory, but they also sent out questions about depression um, in using a clinical depression screening tool. And then they also asked questions about their per professional satisfaction. The majority of the respondents were married uh, females without children, and they worked between 60 to 80 hours per week. And this is a um, summary of their results. So you can see that of the, um, of the high emotional exhaustion, they had 58% of their residents scoring in this range of high emotional exhaustion. They had 52% of their residents scoring in high depersonalization, and they had 40% of their residents scoring in low personal accomplishment category. When looking at their depression screening, they had 37% of residents categorized as depressed using the clinical depression screening tool. As you can imagine, higher scores of the clinical depression survey correlated with higher depersonalization and emotional exhaustion. And higher depression screening scores were more likely to regret choosing OBGYN and had a lower job dissatisfaction. So of this group of 58% that scored high in emotional exhaustion, 59 were depressed meeting or meeting criteria based on the clinical depression screen that they sent out. Of this category, 52% that scored high depersonalization, 52% were also meeting uh, criteria for depression. And in this personal accomplishment rate, again, 40% were also meeting criteria for depression. So next I thought it would be very interesting to look at our residents and our data to see if we were burned out. So here is an example of the Maslach burnout inventory that all of the residents were invited to um, take. This is just an example of the emotional exhaustion items. So for example, I feel used up at the end of the workday. And depending on how often you felt this way, you would choose a score between zero and six, zero being never and six being every single day. So there were questions for emotional exhaustion, um, 22 questions to in total. And this is a sample individual report um, for one of our residents. You can see that the, at the top, this is the frequency in which these events happen. So um, for example, this particular resident exhibited symptoms of emotional exhaustion one to three times per week with their score of a 4.5. Um, reported symptoms of depersonalization somewhere between, between three to four times per month, and also felt um, a sense of personal accomplishment three to four times per month. But what I thought was actually the more interesting part of the data is where the program gives you a percentile score of how you compare to 11,000 other healthcare workers across the country who had also taken the survey. So um, down here you'll see that this score, oh, this score um, correlates to being at the 97th percentile for emotional exhaustion, the 94th percentile for depersonalization, and the 28th percentile for personal accomplishment. So looking at all of our residents, every single one of us who responded to the survey, this is our emotional exhaustion scores. You can see that there are six residents who are scoring above the 90th percentile. I want to mention, the program um, recommended that if you are above the 90th percentile, that you make some changes to address your symptoms of burnout. So six out of 10, or sorry, six out of 24 are meeting criteria for burnout based on emotional exhaustion. For depersonalization, we had 10 residents scoring above the 90th percentile. And when looking at this data together, emotional exhaustion and depersonalization, you can see that there are five residents who are above this 90th percentile meeting criteria on both symptoms of burnout. So in summary, 25% of us are scoring high for emotional exhaustion, 42% scoring high for depersonalization, 46% have at least one symptom of burnout, and 21% are meeting criteria for both um, emotional exhaustion and depersonalization. So now let's talk about some of the factors that contribute to resident burnout. Um, this list is by no means exhaustive. There are many, many, many other things that we could add to this list. And these are just some of the um, occupational burnout risk factors. There are many other things in our home lives, our personal lives, obviously, social lives, that really contribute to our burnout. But here are some work-specific things. Um, number one, time demands. Not only are we working 12 hours a day, 
five days a week, adding a call shift on the weekend, but it's also the time that we're putting in at home, studying, researching, looking up things for the case the next day that really devours most of our time, making it difficult for us to do things that might improve our wellness outside of work. Um, the lack of control of our work schedule has been a factor that has definitely contributed to burnout and well described. Not being able to take a day off for personal events, for going to important things in your family's lives or things like that has been um, very stressful for residents and clearly um, something that contributes to our burnout. We inherently have a difficult job just being in medicine and specifically in OBGYN. Um, we often find ourselves in very emotionally charged situations. Um, hopefully. You know, this doesn't happen, but when we have a bad outcome and we have a neonatal death, those are very emotionally charged situations that take a lot of toll on our um, own emotional health. And the intensity of our workday and whether or not it interferes with our home life has definitely been described. And actually, one thing I thought was interesting, the intensity of the workday and how much it interferes with the home life was actually thought to be more disruptive to our wellness than inadequate sleep or chronic um, sleep deprivation. So here are some other things that make burnout worse. I think this is more of a global um, issue, is that the culture of medicine that we all start out in is one that really supports and rewards a physician's individual achievement, independent judgment, self-reliance, and a self-sacrifice personality. And so I feel like it kind of sets up this unrealistic expectation that the best doctors are really like little islands. They don't need to ask for anything. They don't need help. They're never sick. And I think when this is the expectation that we set up, it's really difficult for us to be introspective and look into what we need from a wellness perspective and make those changes that might be needed. There's definitely been a clear link between physician burnout and um, effect on patient care that's been well described in literature, um, especially medical errors. So in one report, 75% of residents who met criteria for burnout had a two to three times increased probability of reporting suboptimal patient care, either monthly or weekly. Some examples of the suboptimal patient care included failure to fully discuss treatment options with a patient or answer patient questions, treatment or medication errors that were not due to a lack of knowledge of the medication or inexperience with prescribing that medicine, and reduce attentiveness or caring behavior towards their patients. Um, the impact of burnout, I can't stress this enough, is not just impacting ourselves and our individual. It's actually really expanded to our patients, our families, our coworkers. Um, these are just some of the impacts of burnout. Poor judgment and patient clear and clinical decision making, increased hostility towards patients and decreased empathy, medical errors and adverse patient events, poor psychological health and career dissatisfaction, a diminished relationship with your colleagues and family members. And then lastly, um, burnout can definitely precipitate chemical dependencies if you're using them to um, cope. And they can precipitate mood disorders, especially if you've had a history of a mood disorder in the past, it can be um, a triggering factor. And, and for um, many people who have burnout, suicidal ideation can come along with it, especially if it's coming along with a depression. So in this study, Amer the American College of Surgeons sent out a survey in 2008 asking about suicidal ideation. And what they found was that 6% of surgeons had thought about suicide within the past year. And that's actually a pretty conservative number, um, similar to the general population. Lots of other studies have suggested that our suicidal ideation as a field is much higher than 6%. 78% um, of the respondents had symptoms of depression, but only 26% of those surgeons had sought out psychiatric help. 60% admitted that they were reluctant to seek help for treatment for depression due to potential repercussions from their employer or from the state licensing boards, and only 22% were treated with antidepressants in the last 12 months. So this is what in part contributes to the 400 physician suicides that we have in our country every single year. Physicians are more than twice as likely to commit suicide compared to non-physicians, and female physicians are three times more likely than their male physician counterparts to commit suicide. So um, I debated back and forth about whether or not to share this video with you today, but ultimately I decided that um, suicide in medicine is a very important topic that I don't think that we've discussed enough. Um, for me, suicide in medicine became very real when one of my classmates killed himself in our second year of medical school. And so um, I think that by increasing awareness and talking about it, we can help support our peers when they might need us the most. Cool. Okay. Medical training is challenging.
challenging. It can be frustrating. Exhausting. Overwhelming. Especially when things pile up on you. My marriage is coming apart. I took out $183,000 in loans. I made it. IT, IT. IT, It's coming. Really down? Not able to sleep or sleeping too much. Shutting her friends out, giving her stuff away. If somebody just doesn't seem like himself. Not doing things, he used to love. Showing up late, not getting things done. If somebody starts acting reckless or irritable. Yelling at nurses, snapping at patients. Drinking too much. He might be feeling burned out, or depressed, or hopeless. People who are smart and talented, they get overwhelmed, just like anybody else. And when they do, they may find it even harder to ask for help. Medical students and residents have higher rates of depression and burnout than other adults. They have a higher risk of suicide, too. That's something we all need to understand. The risks, and how to look out for ourselves, and each other. And when it happens, people say, I had no idea. I thought he was just upset. I thought she'd get over it. I wish he'd come to me. I wish he'd said something. I wish I'd said something. And now it's too late. Suicide can be prevented. If someone you know is acting differently or really down, don't assume he'll get over it. Say something. Say, are you okay? How can I help? The best way to prevent suicide just to show you can you like and get seconds. the person the help you need. So don't be afraid to ask talking. straight out. Are you feeling so bad? <clears throat> You're thinking about taking your life? People want someone to ask. They want someone to care. Faculty, peers, friends, anyone can ask. Are you thinking about killing yourself? And if she says yes, or maybe, or sometimes, here's what you don't say. That's crazy. One mistake isn't worth killing yourself over. That's not okay. going to solve anything. What you do say is, I'm sorry you're feeling so bad. How can I help? We'll get through this together. Let's get you some help. Assume you're the only one who will reach out and give this person the help she needs. None of us should be ashamed of getting help. Getting help is the strong, professional thing to do. Let her know she has options, that there are people she can talk to. Let her know she can always turn to you. Make sure she has the National Suicide Lifeline number and help her find someone to call. Someone who knows how to help. Ask the Dean for Student Affairs or the Program Director. If you think she's about to hurt herself, don't leave her alone. Take her to the emergency room. Call 911. We all get down. We all have our bad days. But sometimes it's more than that. If you think something's wrong, the only way to find out is to ask. Are you thinking about ending your life? Don't wait until you're sure. Trust your gut. It never hurts to ask. It never hurts to care. It can make a big difference. Any one of us can make a difference. <laughs> All the difference. In someone's life. Yeah, that's probably good. Make it sound. So it was because of um, the suicide of Dr. Greg Feldman, um, who was a general surgery graduate from Stanford University, that Stanford University decided to make some major changes in their wellness curriculum and really take wellness for their residents seriously. So this is Dr. Greg Feldman. Um, he was a graduate of Harvard Medical School, completed his general surgery residency at Stanford University, and he was four months into his vascular fellowship at Northwestern when he committed suicide in 2010. His coworkers reported that he seemed like a very happy individual. Um, one fellow resident described him as extremely good at balancing his work and non-work life and that he cared about getting other residents to have fun both at work and outside the hospital. So I just want to um, take a moment to emphasize that it's not always obvious who needs help and that's why it's so important that we're looking out for each other all of the time and not just sometimes. This is um, the Balance in Life program that Stanford General Surgery Residency incorporated into their curriculum. And this is a picture of their residents at one of their monthly sporting events. Their focus was on four major areas of wellness, professional, physical, psychological, and social. In regards to their professional well-being, um, to promote this, they established a 
resident mentorship program between junior and senior residents. And the department funded quarterly lunch meetings to promote um, and provide an informal setting for residents to talk to each other about any sort of concerns, whether it be with work, with research, with their personal life, anything at all. They also organized leadership training and they had an annual ropes course where all of the residents attended and um, participated in um, team building and just uh, developing their relationship outside of work. In regards to their physical well-being, one of the problems that the residents acknowledged was that they didn't have access to healthy food options at the hospital. So to fix this, they purchased a refrigerator and stocked it 24-7 with healthy food and drinks. The department also made it a priority for their residents to see their doctor, their dentist, and any sort of mental health appointments that they needed throughout the year. Um, incoming interns were provided with a list of providers, and it was an expectation that they make those appointments with their doctor and set them up right away. Um, to improve psychological well-being, the department provided protected time for each resident class to meet with a psychologist for an hour and a half every six weeks. Individual residents were encouraged to seek out the psychologist if they needed to on an as-needed basis if they wanted to discuss more personal concerns or other issues. Um, one resident commented that it's very validating and supportive to hear about the shared experiences of residency among individuals dealing with sim similar scenarios that could individually make one feel very isolated. I think that this is actually very true. I wanted to echo this sentiment and encourage the residents to share experiences with each other because really our support, our greatest support group is our residents who are going through the same experiences that we are. And lastly, the department recognized the value of social well-being and its relationship to physical and psychosocial health. Um, the program funded events such as happy hours, sporting events, and outdoor activities uh, for all the residents. They appointed one to two residents a year to put, they were put in charge of organizing these events. Um, faculty was invited to attend some of the events to build relationships between residents and faculty. Um, and the overall goal was to promote and support balance among the residents. The AMA recently came out with several new guidelines about um, changing uh, training programs to support wellness. Um, this is the revised AMA policy addressing accelerating change in medical education and professional satisfaction in physician sustainability. The policy called for all training programs to provide urgent and emergent access to low-cost confidential health care for mental and substance abuse counseling that are readily available. The services should be on-site or near, um, th near the residency training program, or if you're geographically isolated, be available through telemedicine. And all um, counselors should be separate and away from any sort of grading system that might exist for the residents. Um, the AMA also encouraged routine health screening for um, problems, or uh, routine health screening and urging programs to designate already allocated time to setting up those appointments and getting um, residents to attend those appointments. They discouraged medical licensing boards from asking about a past medical history of mental health issues or substance abuse and instead focusing on whether or not that physician seemed to be impaired at work and then supporting those physicians to seek treatment. In regards to med medical education, the AMA um, encouraged medical schools to create a substance abuse awareness program and suicide prevention screening programs that would be available to all medical students on an opt-out basis. Um, they should provide anonymity, confidentiality, and protection from administrative action um, and provide intervention for at-risk students. Um, and then they, should, they also encourage all uh, medical schools to inform students and faculty about personal mental health, substance use, and addiction, and other risk factors that might contribute to suicidal ideation. So I really like this analogy. Please put on your oxygen mask before assisting others. Um, just reminding us that we need to take care of ourselves before we can take care of our patients. So let's now talk about um, promoting resiliency and what we can do to improve our occupational wellness. So the first thing, setting limits and decreasing stress in other areas of our life. As I mentioned, our wellness is not just our occupational health, and um, this talk is really addressing things within that realm, but there are, are many, many others within our areas within our life that are causing us stress. So if you can identify those other areas, try to minimize those stresses in the other areas, it might be able to allow you to cope better with occupational stress, a lot of which, as residents, we're not really able to control. Um, exercise. Exercise is a huge thing. It's been very well documented that exercise can help um, relieve stress um, and 
I think the major issue though is like our time and our motivation to do that. Um, but I have to say like to exercise. Um, seeking out. <laughs> Seeking out peer support, um, counseling, and venting, incredibly therapeutic. Venting is huge. That's my personal favorite. So going out to trivia with your class, and it, who cares if you play trivia, but if you're talking to each other and helping each other get through difficult situations, that is really the most supportive thing that we can do for each other. Um, cultivating relaxation, connecting with friends and family, humor, laughing. Um, all incredibly effective at um, decreasing stress and promoting resiliency. Some other areas um, are development of self-awareness skills, like mindful meditation, reflective writing, um, and practice of self-care activities. So um, self-care practices are supposed to help um, provide a sustainable way that we can give our compassion, give sensitivity, and treat our patients effectively. And so some small, just a couple of few examples of self-care practices are um, stopping at a window in your workplace and looking at something in nature and really giving it your full attention for those few moments to help ground you back down. Um, calling a timeout if you notice that things are getting a little bit out of hand and you're feeling very emotional. Just say, I need a timeout, I need a break. Um, asking a colleague just to talk about that event. Staying connected with the outside world and checking in with your loved ones is incredibly important. And then after you complete a, a task, uh, reward yourself with uh, an early coffee break or a snack. <laughs> so self-awareness self practices involves um, attending to the needs of the patient, the work environment, and your experience all at the same time. And two really um, well-reported, uh, documented ways to do this are mindful meditation and reflective writing. Both are um, designed to make you more aware of the thoughts, the feelings that you're having in that moment, and um, helping kind of almost the reflective writing aspect is to help give you a personal way to vent out any thoughts or feelings that you're having that you can't you know, put in a medical chart, but you can write down how it's affecting you so that you can be aware of that. Um, when functioning with less self-awareness, clinicians have um, been thought to lose perspective, experience more stress in their work environment, and have a greater likelihood for compassion, fatigue, and burnout. So here are a few um, things that the attendings can do, which um, I think our attendings do a lot of these already, so um, thank you for that. Um, attendings can, can you continue to create a supportive working community, um, provide adequate mentoring, taking on residents and guiding them through difficult issues or being a, being a, sh um, a help to them. Um, Providing appropriate level of supervision, uh, maybe less for the senior residents as they're gaining more independence and more autonomy. Um, promoting feelings of choice and control can help reduce some stress at work. Um, promotion of fairness and justice in the workplace. Um, and then lastly, appropriate recognition, recognition and reward is one thing that can um, really help promote resident resiliency. So next, I want to take you with some campus res through some campus resources that we have. And I know that not all of you know about these because the um, GME wellness survey that went out showed that only 7% of residents had ever seen this website or know of any of these resources. So on MedHub, this is, um, this is the UW Health Resident Wellness Resource link. It's over here on the right side, which I know none of us ever look over on the side, but there's the link right there. If you click on it, it opens up this resident wellness page, and um, there are hyperlinks to all sorts of different resources. So nutrition, um, physical fitness. This uh, has some fitness gear and discounts. I don't know if anyone's ever checked this one out. General health um, recommendations for how to improve your sleep. There are um, tobacco, drug addiction um, resources on this general health website here. Um, looking for babysitters or um, various household resources are listed here. There's a weight management um, link. And there's also this wellness options at work website that has a lot of um, healthy eating tips, exercise tips, stress um, tips on that website. Um, in the emotional wellness uh, category, there's a link to the Life Matters website and the Employee Assistance Program. Has anybody ever gone to that website? No? 
Okay, one person has seen this website. Um, I'm going to talk about it in depth in just a second. Um, stress management is also listed here, and then lactation resources are also listed on this website in case anybody uh, needs to know. So this is, if you click on the Employee Assistance Program, it takes you to this website. This is a free 24-hour a day, seven day a week, um, confidential telephone counseling service. So if you scroll down on this page, there's a phone number, and I called it just to make sure it works, and a very nice lady named Kathy from Waukesha answered the phone, <laughs> and she said, how can I help you? And I said, I'm just checking out this service, like what sort of things do you offer? And she ran through this whole list with me. Um, they offer, re it really, any, if you have any question or issue, they can guide you to the resource that you need. They will, they will provide unlimited like telephone counseling. So if you're like in a crisis and just are like, oh my gosh, this horrible thing happened, like I need help, you call them and they'll stay on the phone with you. And then if it, if they feel like um, you would be a good candidate or if you want to have in-person counseling in Madison, they will direct you towards the um, counselors who are part of their organization um, in Madison. And this is already a service that the University of Wisconsin pays for. So it's already paid for and we can use it anytime. They'll also talk to you about um, any sort of financial consultations. They'll do mainly like budgeting issues, like if you want to figure out how to budget your loans or if you want to, um, I don't know, buy a house or something like that, they will help guide you through that. Um, they don't do any sort of like disability insurance or insurance planning things, but they can help get you in touch with those people. Um, they do free legal consultations, and I asked her like what sort of things that meant, and she said, well, if you get a parking ticket or if you um, want to get divorced, like, or, I, <laughs> Well, that was an example, not that you would want to, but she said that they could help you do that. Okay, that one was off track. Um, tobacco cessation, there is a program there. Um, helping get care for child care or like elderly care services are also something that they do. They get, can get you in touch with like gyms, all sorts of things. Basically, if you have a problem or a question, you just call Kathy and she will get you connected. <laughs> So it, also on MedHub, if you scroll down to this bottom area, there is a link to the wellness resources um, folder. And if you open this folder, there is um, a number of different documents. These are all just kind of things that you can read on your own time. But some of the helpful ones um, are 30 steps to relaxation. Um, Oh, the next one, coping with stress of a medical liability claim. Um, OBGYN is one of the most litigious fields of medicine, so should you find yourself named in a lawsuit, you could go here and um, read about that. Um, delivering bad news, learning how to um, do that basically, and like what sort of things that you should be thinking about and what sort of things that you should be sure to tell your patient about all included here. If you haven't already um, signed up for the gym at Meritor, the free 24-hour gym, this is where you can download the form to do that. The employee assistance program is also relisted right here in case um, you, this is an easier way to access it. Um, and then time management tips, all sorts of great resources and options. So here's a list of some references. Um, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of my fantastic residents. Thank you for the faculty for promoting our wellness. Um, I do appreciate it. I would love to hear your thoughts on wellness, and I'll take any questions. When you looked at the resident data, it sounds like the global data says they don't know if it's interns or like higher in PGY mm. level. Did you notice an association with like? one or the other, or was it was pretty spread out? It was pretty spread out. I was actually a little bit surprised by that uh, myself, but it, it was across all years. Yeah. yeah. I had this really interesting stuff out of Stanford after the, the one gentleman committed suicide, and all this stuff that they implemented to try to make the resident wellness better, mm -hmm. but there wasn't any data that said mm -hmm. that you felt better after. And what I noticed is a lot of the stuff they implemented are things that you guys do here, yet 25% of the residents are above where they need to be 95th percentile, and there's another 25% or so that's like two call shifts away from jumping up. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, there were, there were a lot. <laughs> what can you do? I mean, that's really the question, like, you know, there's, there's I know. the work hours are less, but even with less work hours, people still report that they have so many things externally, spouses, kids, so what, what, do you, what have you read? What can you actually do? What makes a difference? It seems like all of these things help 
a little bit. And so maybe if we did all of them, we would start to make a significant improvement in our wellness, but it's so, it's so hard to do all of these things because, I mean, sure, if we did everything, we would just be working six hour days and like a couple days a week, like half time, and I'm sure our wellness would be better, but it, it's just, I don't, I don't know if it's possible to have a completely stress-free, burnout-free environment. I, I would suggest that evolution, this whole thing will take time, where you put the faculty. It's just, if you think about how it was even 10 years ago, it's just a freaking remarkable difference. Okay? This was actually a topic that I have a, a <clears throat> pretty high interest in, having experienced some traumatic events in my residency, you know, including divorce, including, you know, different things. That, that just went on. And one of the things that I've come across in, in the readings that I've done is that there's a reason that people who have families and children, why they tend to do better. Hmm. And it's typically people who have very supportive families, who have families and children that are very supportive. Mm -hmm. And if you can facilitate that type of environment in the workplace or in the residency, then that's places that people will tend to do better too. And if you if you read different books, then that's what what they tend to encourage. I think Dr. Rice does a, a really nice job of facilitating diversity. And when I say that, I'm including cultural, religious, race, all those kinds of things. And the more that you do that, the more that you create an open environment. <laughs> And the more that you, then when you bring people in, they're less likely to feel isolated at that point. So they have a place that they feel safe, a place that they feel open, a place that they feel welcome. And having been at three different residencies teaching, mm -hmm. I see in our residents that there is that more open environment. And I think that in our residency, we're less likely to have individuals that may feel isolated because there's always someone there that has experienced something or that's going to be open. And the other thing is, I think we're more likely to say something, for instance, if you're involved in a lawsuit, in there. I know what you're feeling. Or if you've been involved in a divorce, you're going through a divorce, I think we're much more likely to say, join the club. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So uh -huh. facilitating diversity, it's huge. Culture, mm -hmm. religion, different things like that, you're going to feel less isolated. And I think that's one of the keys in the readings that I've done mm -hmm. that we need to do. And I think we're really on the road to doing that. We're not going to change the stress. It's yeah. always going to be there. Yes. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. I'll say one thing, and I'm not really exactly sure how this rolls for the residents right now, but historically, the expectation, and I will absolutely admit, is so much better than when I train, um, is that should someone feel the need to take a break, I need a day, I need three days, for whatever reason, it is very difficult to do that because the systems, and not just residency, but also practice, mm -hmm. are set up in such a way that if you step aside, when you come back, you have to make up that mm -hmm. You have to see the patients you didn't see. You have to make the call you missed. And those things I would love to see different for residents and for people in practice. And I will say one of the huge, amazing, couldn't believe this was my new reality was transitioning to UHS. If I was gone for a day, my partners, the nurse practitioners, saw the patients that needed to be seen. I didn't have to come back mm -hmm. and double duty. Mm -hmm. A little different, you more received, but nonetheless, it was amazing. Um, but I'll say for residents to be gone, to miss a call and that expectation, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying it's wrong because there absolutely has to be a balance, but I think it's worthy of an internal discussion how really should that be handled not only in residency but also in practice should you need to be off whether it's a maternity leave a medical leave or you just need a day 
Mm -hmm. What's the expectation in terms of making that call? Because that's a huge disincentive to ever saying, I need to take a break. Yeah. Good point. Eliza? I, and I think a further that I think it's also a disincentive to colleagues around you saying, gosh, you seem like you're not doing very well. Um, in, during my residency, I, we experienced um, somebody have a relapse of a substance abuse issue. And I think we all sort of thought maybe something was going on. We mm -hmm. knew she wasn't doing well for a while. Um, and but everybody lived in fear of somebody deciding they needed to take time off. Because time off for one resident mm -hmm. was more time than every other resident. And still, in practice, I mean, that's what it means. Time off for one of my colleagues means more time for me. Um, so we need to expand our depth, our reserve, somebody to do the work when somebody else can't do the work. And that's across the board that, that we need to do that because that's a huge <coughs> contributor to stress and, and anxiety mm -hmm. about taking time off yeah. yourself and also um, advocating for other people taking time. Yeah, and I'm sure the residents can appreciate this is not just at the resident level. And our general scrutinized redoing their workforce entirely, which is so appropriate. Ahmed? Um, thank you for the presentation. This is actually very important. Um, and I wanted to echo a couple of notes. I agree that the measures that Stanford did actually was implemented, but yet to be measured and yet to show an, an impact. And I cannot agree more about um, getting together um, and uh, promoting this um, wellness, and not in a structured way, but in the very last picture that you placed, which is this. This has been done over and over again in the healthcare industry, in the Silicon Valley, and the mm. airline industry. Mm. The, the key what they have found uh, in England and Sweden, that's the healthcare industry. Silicon Valley is uh, Google and Yahoo, and uh, the airline industry with the ATC air traffic control. What they have figured at the end with what everybody said is, it's not your time out and you go away from the hospital and go with your mm -hmm. family, spouse, or, or, you know, or take a travel. Actually, what they have found to be consistently right is to get with the same group that you work in hospital, outside the hospital. That has been consistently being shown to promote wellness, not mm -hmm. the um, take a day off and go home and, you know, it's none of that. It's mm -hmm. consistently the non-curricular activity with the your same group, group. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the most important, the same group that you work with, you get off work, you know, and that's like <coughs> residence retreat and stuff like that. And that has been done. Actually, Epic consider, uh, recently have adopted this and by building uh, this retreat in the same building for all their coders to take actually two hours a day just to go there and do stuff that has nothing to do with, with, the, with, the, with the coding and with working. Um, Google have done that. The uh, healthcare system in England have consistently done that and measured actually that in terms of all physicians that serve, take certain mm -hmm. times off the same day at certain it's like a recess. So there's something to look for and you take a, what yeah. call a tea break and then go yeah. there and just mm -hmm. do nothing to do with medicine, just mingle around and, and talk about it. That is the only thing that That's I have good. seen consistently yield measures. Nothing, uh, it's not the other things that people try to do. Stanford uh, did that uh, football team or mm -hmm. basketball or baseball. Baseball? That is the thing that um, is huge. That the yeah. And I, I, consistent, I, I truly believe in that. that is that's, a, that's a good point. It makes sense to me. You know, stay from the workplace. For you have anything to share? Yeah, Janessa, excellent. Thought you were quickly well informed. Do you have any opinions regarding what our department could do better? I think there are, there are a few areas where I thought we could improve um, upon and maybe adopt some of the things that Stanford's doing. Um, for example, we don't have any structured psychological um, wellness time where we meet with a counselor. I think that would be a great place to start, just maybe like w even once a year or twice a year, like meeting with a, 
psychologists as a group, I think it would be huge. Um, I think that there's room for improvement in our mentorship program. Um, I know that we've kind of started um, the mentorship program with a um, resident faculty and developing those relationships more would be great. Um, and then also promoting like the residents to resident mentorship would be a, a huge step. Uh, there's also there's already a natural like bond that forms between the first and the third year who on Merit or Night Float together, but um, having like dedicated time within the department to develop that as a real mentorship program would be, I think, huge. I was gonna say I talked to a lot of my Love. I talked to a lot of my friends who are in OBGYN uh, residency programs around the country, and I think that ours is it, exceptional. Yeah. Ours is I especially really amazing. I spend a lot more time with the generals than I do anyone else's in first and second year, and I think that every generalist in the generalist division I feel comfortable going to going to Dr. Williams' house. Dr. Bill's supposed to be able to be given through to this mm -hmm. soon. Yeah. I mean, there's just like so much that you guys do, and I think I can speak for most of us when I say that we appreciate it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, just in regards to the counseling, um, as someone who had a bad outcome and tried to get counseling services, the counselors don't work after hours, and so it really has to be incorporated in, like, mm. yeah, um, part of the. difficult to leave so having it built into like the Thursday morning or something yeah. would be helpful or having counselors who block out that time because they or, you know if they're out in the community they can't necessarily say oh well you only have Thursday morning that's fine with me you know, they have other clients yeah. good point mm -hmm. Exercise, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think some of the, the what people have said about the Stanford program, I, I think, are the points are well taken. But one thing that I, I think they do well is that they have a, a real institutional commitment to this. So you, if you're actually, you get in trouble if you don't go to the dentist. You get in trouble if you don't go to the doctor. Your, your attending forbids you from working at the days that you're supposed to go to the dentist. And I think that is uh, different from most yeah. places. Yeah. Um, and also, the, the thing that we is that they have healthy snacks. Um, just to give an example of how things are here. Um, um, at Merida, it's actually, it's actually pretty good. It's pretty at good. W, the GME used to provide snacks for us in the hospital. And they took it away because they said it was too, way too expensive. It was $60,000 a year. And like, I kind of think about all the cheap labor that residents provide for the hospital. And every week, we get an email from uh, Dr. Green that the hospital is at capacity. So clearly, the hospital is humming. We're facilitating that. I think we're providing more than $60,000 worth of work. Um, so it doesn't seem like it would be that hard to provide some help. Like, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I agree with everybody that we have such strong departmental and I think institutional support to make these kinds of wellness programs work. And Beth Potter, who many of you might know, who was the medical director at the Winger Family Medicine Clinic, which is right downstairs from our Arena Clinic, she just took on the role with all of UW Health to do a fully wellness programming that will be overlapping a lot with the resident wellness stuff. And I think the more we institutionalize it within the organization but also within our department, the better it will be for everybody. Because what we don't want is to have this laundry list of things that each individual person should do to make themselves well, and then make it be an individual responsibility that you have to be stressed out about the fact that you didn't make yourself well. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I agree with that. 
I'm seeing an Excel spreadsheet for the doctor dental issue. <laughs> <laughs> this is very important stuff, and this is more of an observation that I think that each of us have to think about, is that wellness and improving things and some of the things that we talked about this morning, that's all great, but it comes at a cost. And there are implications to making some of these changes. And I think that each of us have to sit back and think about and say, well, what are we willing to maybe sacrifice or give up to make our lives better? And whether that be financial, or whether that be, you know, increased frequency of being available for hospital duties for shorter durations. These are the stumbling blocks. And because the reality is, is that we have to provide the service. And if you bring more individuals in, there are going to be sacrifices to be made. And in my mm -hmm. past experience, that is the big stumbling block when you start talking about doing things. Yeah, I think it's a very good point, especially for the residents to consider as you mature and get on your job and for the training, et cetera. You know, you have to balance that whole thing against decreased income. It's just a fact. And I would argue that most people would struggle hard to make sure that that balance is right, money for time. And thank you for bringing that forward. It's just practical. I recently made that choice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. So, coincidentally, I have a meeting this afternoon with the GME administrator to advocate for whatever residents really want right now. And wellness is obviously our hot topic. What we've been running into is sort of what Kevin was talking about is it's never in the budget, everything or anything that we're asking for. So, I think pretty much we need to prioritize like one big ask, probably. Do you have anything in mind that that would be that we should focus on asking for? Hmm. I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? Food? Counseling are the big things, but I think we're not going to get all of those things. I think having dedicated time for counseling would be helpful. I mean, exercise, we thankfully have access to two free gyms. But they could, couldn't they get access? Yeah, but that's the thing. Residents don't want to come all the way from UW to Maryland to work out. People don't want to call UW to work out because most of them mm. are there on the shelf time. There used to be a gym at UW. Yeah. Oh, really? No, it's going to be my thing. The but gym at UW? Six room into at least a little workout room to start with. How about the public exam room? Charlotte, we're glad you're at the table. What part of this? How many? Who else is going to be at the table with you? Other? This is just me this afternoon. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think. And who are you meeting with? Lee Larson. Yeah, I think. I think you're right to realize. Look, if you go in there with a laundry list, you can say, "I have a laundry list." I'm going to focus on this, and uh, you know, you could after the session maybe take a little poll. You know, it's. It, it, I really do think that what Kevin mentioned in terms of it seems incredibly short-sighted. Um, but the longer I'm in this job, I do realize there's a lot of, there's, there's just, there's a lot. I find it excusable that they can't provide snacks, but they, the landscape is complicated, especially with the integration process. It's be hard to sit in a room with a group of residents saying that buying snacks. That's just like nonsense. Okay, anything else? <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Rice.